projects. I think there's six. Six yeah. projects. Um, so we'll be concentrating on, on, on those specific projects. And also she's joined by David Barrett, who uh, recently wrote an article for about her uh, in our monthly uh, about a few months ago. A few months ago. So um, questions from the audience are invited at any point, yeah? During the course of it rather than way to the end. So um, do feel free to ask any questions that occur to you. So I'd like to welcome Elizabeth and David. Well, I'll just add to that that uh, the format will be that Liz will be just presenting these projects and speaking about them as if she was doing her own slide talk, and I'll be asking questions as we go along rather than a simply kind of interview situation. And adding to what Andrew said, yes, we do want questions. Anyone can just throw stuff in as they wish. But we will try and have a, a small session at the end, which is just questions on the floor. Um, so Liz can begin with the slides. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> this is called um, Untitled Tomato, and uh, it was a piece of work that um, I made for my final um, MA exhibition. And Although it's photographic, it actually started off as, as being an object. And throughout uh, my work, I've, I've kind of played with using photography, but using photography to, in a way to make objects. I don't really think of them as photographic, um, as photographs. Um, so my intention in making this piece of work was to quite literally put the skin of a tomato around uh, a piece of wood. And I didn't know how to do it, so I employed different, different ways of going about it, from quite literally taking the skins of tomatoes and putting them around wood, um, to eventually getting quite, fr getting quite frustrated to deciding to take up um, photography. And I came across a camera called a periphery camera that actually photographs objects 360 degrees. Um, it took me quite a long time to find this camera because I wanted to be quite pure in the way that I was using photography. So the camera is quite literally stretched. It's, it's, it's a 360 um, degree photograph of, of the tomato. Um, and what was quite interesting about it was that every time you photographed a tomato, you'd end up with a completely different image. And it was actually quite frustrating um, process to use. Um, the image on the left is actually a, a tomato that's been manipulated so that it has a, a piece of wood inside it, but I think actually that the image on the right is, is much more successful. Can I ask why you, I mean, why a tomato for a start? It's, you always talked about I wanted to have the skin of a tomato on a piece of wood, but you never kind um. of got to why <laughs> the skin of a tomato. Um, I think the work that I'd been making b before then had, had been um, kind of working through being quite obsessed by objects and it, it's quite a difficult thing to talk about because I don't really know um, where that obsession comes from and part, part of making the work then was to find out what that was about so that's why I made the work um, and I was working very in a way quite intuitively in just having faith that if I made the work I'd find that out and in a way, it was interesting what other people brought to the work, not really. I made it, and it was quite interesting what people said about it in terms of, I suppose, um, looking at it much more deeply. But what, I, what I've been finding was that as I was making, making um, work, that it you know, eventually turned into another object, so the obsession evolved into something else. I mean, it's, it's interesting with a, we are looking at a tomato, and the thing about tomatoes is that they are very strikingly you know, visual objects, mm. and these are the things that you see in supermarkets kind of buffed up to the most extraordinary lush red. Yeah. And this kind of idea of you know, waxing the fruit and vegetables in a supermarket or genetically engineering stuff, which this kind of brings to mind as well, like in a super tomato or something. And this idea of the skin as an image, mm. um, that it dissolves the object entirely. So we're looking at almost a kind of landscape of mm. tomato. And this is one of the things I picked up. And also the format that it has is very filmic, um, or like almost like a billboard, like an advert. Yeah. So it is very much a 
about image, you know, it, mm. it loses the object entirely, which, I mean, you are a sculptor, and this is a kind of case of emptying the object out of the work. I mean, mm. how did you feel about that? Was that something you were aiming to do? Well, I, as, as I said, I, I'd never thought of these as being... Um, I was making um, objects as photographs because a lot of them couldn't be made as objects. They'd either disintegrate or they were about com um, combining people into objects. So they, they were kind of made in the camera. I was really using the camera as if it was a studio. Um, and, and, and partly I wasn't really so concerned about the materiality of, of, of whether it was a photograph mm. or whether it was an object. And in fact, um, you know, the objects that I was making were quite unsatisfactory. They were kind of about making sculpture, not, it was always that the things I was doing kind of secretly outside of college that was, was became much more interesting. Yeah. What, were they? what was I doing secretly? <laughs> 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 Um, I, I was, I was, actually, I was um, using figures and objects and combining them together, and partly because I was working in a, I suppose, in a sculpture studio, it just seemed like an impossible to do that. So, um, and when I was, you know, having tutorials, there'd be these great big lumps of sculpture in the middle of the studio, and then I kind of pull out my my photographs and. Um, at the end of a tutorial, and, and gradually I had the confidence to, to, to work with photography. Um, but I never, really, as I say, I never really thought of them as, as being photographs, I really thought of them as being objects. And I think, you know, it's quite interesting how people use photography. As I said, I was, I was, it was important I was using it in quite a pure way, so that I wasn't, um, I mean, it's, you know, this was made in 1990, and when you think of um, things like Photoshop now, you know, we're so used to seeing manipulated objects, but in a way, it, I mean, quite a short, time you know, ago, kind of um, seven years ago, um, I wanted to be quite pure about the object and the fact that it was quite literally made through a photographic process. It wasn't um, um, manipulated in any other way. It's interesting that you say you weren't really bothered about it being a photo or a sculpture and this, this is something that crops up all through your work, this kind of hovering between the two states. Mm. Um, I kind of tried to call your work photo sculptures at one point in the article and decided <laughs> against it, but I ended up calling it um, reproduction sculpture, yeah. or reprographic sculpture, sorry, yeah. um, which we'll come to, and particularly the cans, which we'll come to is something yeah. that I was thinking of, but it always hovers between these two states or slides from one to the other without really worrying about the states. Yeah. Um, another thing I find interesting about this is that although it's distorted, it is this, it's a simple process, the periphery camera where it's simply a 360 degree image. It's not like you've scanned it and then warped it somehow. Mm. It's a kind of, it is a kind of pure process. It is a straightforward mm. image and this is how a tomato looks if you spin it around and yeah. capture that all at once. Yeah. So that was something that came to mind that it, although it was a distortion, it wasn't a, a kind of intentional distortion. It was almost a distortion through trying to find a kind of purity of it. Yeah, but I think, just mentioning scale, I mean, what was interesting at the same time, I did actually cover um, wood with a red skin, and in, in a way, what became the problem was the, the size that it should be. And I mean, in a way, that that's doesn't so it's, it's not something that comes into, into play with photography because there's certain size that photographs can be, but mm -hmm. when it comes to actually making <coughs> objects, that's all a problem that's that's set. You know, how how large should something be? So, um, and I never really worked that out through the sculpture. It seemed easier. In, in terms of the, the photography, but I mean, these are very large images. They're one meter by three meter print. So, you know, it was very much about kind of walking into this environment of, of, um, of images. They're actually three meters long. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. That's bigger than I thought they were. Yeah. Uh, this was made. Um, an exhibition called Hit and Run that was um, made in a, an old disused um, Westminster community building and different artists were invited to make work <coughs> for the different rooms in, in, the, in this building. I'd actually been working in the building, it'd been my studio and in this particular room um, there had been lots of, of desks that had actually been used by traffic wardens so there was kind of all the paraphernalia of, um, of office workers. And um, 
what I decided to do was, was in a way kind of make a play with um, how objects are used, the fact that you need a particular desk to perform a particular job. Um, you know, you use this desk to work at, you don't use it to, to cook from, it, you know, it has a particular function. So the actual desk was reduced to 50% of the original size. Um, when it was shown, it didn't have the hat stand in the back, it was just as it's seen on the left there. Um, and what became interesting was how, how many people didn't actually notice that the, that the object had been changed in size. And when the exhibition was finished, I actually had it in my studio, and people would come in and put their bags on it or actually go and sit on it. And, and in a way, it made me realize how people, or how we, how, how, how we actually name objects, as long as we recognize them, we name them, but it doesn't really matter if they're authentic objects or if they're the correct scale. Um, and the piece was eventually destroyed. It was in an exhibition and somebody actually sat on it and it was actually, actually broken. There's something with miniatures that do generate a kind of preciousness about them, which is kind of shown by the fact that you know, although they have this kind of own space that they occupy as kind of miniature, world and they're in a sense separate if you kind of puncture that space if you take your own kind of real space into that then they're quite easily crushed um, this idea of preciousness with with the miniatures I mean how do you do you see them as kind of precious objects making them more precious or are they is that not even an issue at all no I mean I, th I think what 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 I've always been concerned about that they're not childlike that they're not toys mm. and that that they don't that, that they exist in an adult world, they're not for children. So, um, I, I mean, obviously they're more fragile, partly because, I mean, it could have been made so that it didn't disintegrate when it was sat on, mm. but that wasn't important to me when I was making it. In, in a way, I just wanted it to, to function as, as an image, as a desk, not as um, a functioning desk. I mean, it wasn't made to, you know, to sit on. But, um, I, I mean, part of, um, when I was making it, I mean, I did actually make it four or five times, so I actually got it to the correct scale. I didn't ever know whether, 50% of the original would be the right size, so I'd have to kind of keep chopping it down to it or remaking it till it got to the right size. But it, uh, that kind of preciousness isn't really something that, um, it becomes part of it, but it's not something well, how that... How did you decide on the right size? So that it wasn't a toy and it was, it was believable, but it wasn't, it still didn't seem like the, the, the right size. I mean, it's interesting you talk about this this sign for the desk, I mean, this is what you, when we look at this, we don't, we don't go, aha, a bit of wood horizontally <laughs> with some legs holding it up, you know, we look at it and we say, oh, this is a desk, because it looks sufficiently like a desk, but we know that desks, you know, unlike bits of wood, have a kind of very specific scale, mm. so this idea of the, the object which is not, that has such a kind of specific signage, I mean, you need this kind of cultural reference for the work to function, it can't, if it was lumps of wood, there, there was no way you'd be able to tell if it was scaled up or down or wherever it was, but you look at this and you know it as a desk, this kind of naming, I mean, this is what goes on in the brain, it's a kind of recognition, it's a framing of, of the world and deciding, right, these bits of wood, when they are in this format, then they are a desk, mm. so this is all about this kind of pattern recognition and signage and image, which is very much part of your work. I mean, again, it's, it almost de-objectifies the work. It's, it's less an object than it is an image or a sign. I mean, it's again slipping between you know, being an object and being an image. This is one of the reasons why I called it, if not photographic sculpture, then a kind mm. of re reprographic sculpture, because it's not about the kind of physicality. Although when you come across the physicality and f try and use it as a physical object, then they get broken. Mm. But I think um, part of what you're saying there is, is, is how the work is, is shown, in the sense that it, it can't really exist in a white, empty gallery, what it, what it could, but in a way then you'd know that it, that it was an, an art object. But you know, part of it being shown there was that you'd you know, expect to see a desk like that in that environment. So kind of putting on that photographic framework is quite importantly how the work is actually framed in mm. terms of how it's shown. And so quite a lot of the work does, I mean a lot of people never notice the desk, people would just walk past it or, so again, you know, if they recognised it because it was, if you like, it had deskness to it, then 
um, it was just a desk, it wasn't a piece of work and there was nothing different about it. So I think it is, it, you know, it's very much about um, perhaps your state of mind when, when you do see the work or whether you're really looking for it or whether it trips you up or not. No, it fits into a compartment of your brain that you know is desk, so right onto desk, I don't need to look at this. Yeah. But if you slip past that and realise there's something else going on, then you'll be engaged and I guess come into the room. I mean, was it at the end of a long room? I mean, did people, could people just glance in and walk past or did they, or did they have to come up and, you know, get close to it to, to see the work? Um, it was actually the last room in, in the building, so it was actually at the top of the building. There was actually another room in front of it, right. so it was almost framed by, by a doorway. Um, but I mean, you know, like the, it was kind of smelly, kind of rotting room. It was kind of, you know, rain was coming through, so it wasn't somewhere that you particularly wanted to, to linger. Um, so people could look in from the doorway and there was a desk in the distance and they thought, desk, Yeah. we can walk yeah. away. Yeah. Could you say something about the surface? The surface of the desk or? Well, I'm not, can you, I'm not quite sure what you mean, sorry. Well, I was trying not to beg the question, but the surface I imagine is, is wood grain. Yeah. Three or four. Yeah. And that has a scale as well. And so it, immediately I'm asking myself, uh, as it were, how much wood was there to the size of the desk? Um, yeah, I do. I'm, I mean, in, in, again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not kind of fastidious about the way that it's made, as long as it, it's um, it's not that you know the the, the the grain of a normal sized desk. I mean, it, it, the grain was reduced. I mean, I looked for a smaller grain of wood. It wasn't the grain that a 50% desk would have, but it wasn't exactly 50% smaller. It was the closest that I could find. No, no, no. Can I ask if it's the first time you worked with an object that was kind of particular to the location, rather than the tomatoes were quite random in its selection, whereas this was particular to the site? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I mean, it really was the first time that I guess I made something for a space. I mean, this was made for, you know, for this, this, this room. Um, and you know, it was particular to the room, yeah. Um, this was made two years ago, and it, it's called Can Splash, and they're beer cans that have been stretched um, to nearly 200% the length of a normal beer can. And it's actually called Can Splash, and it's actually based on a piece by Richard Serra where he threw lead at the corner of the room to, to find the space for the point where the, 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 the floor met the wall. Um, and, and I, in a way, I was interested in the way that, you, that discarded objects, or the way that you find discarded objects. Um, so it's partly kind of, I suppose, in homage to that piece of work. But it, it's also um, to do with the fact that, you know, gradually objects around us are kind of getting larger and larger. Beer cans, we're getting kind of 150% more beer, whatever that means. And so, in a way, I wanted to kind of stretch that, that further. I mean, one of the th interesting things about this comparison with Sarah's lead, well, Sarah's splash, was that it was lead he'd splashed around the corner of the studio or the gallery. Um, and of course, lead's a natural element, and of course, you've got beer cans splashed about, which is not a natural element. But what I kind of find stupidly enjoyable about this piece is that they are throwaway objects, and so they are in a kind of natural state. Yeah. If these objects have a natural state, then then this is it. So they're kind of natural elements in themselves, a kind of new naturalism. I don't know, something something silly really, but I quite enjoy that about it. <laughs> One of the things you come back to is this idea of this kind of mass reproduction 
and coupled with advertising, which is something that particularly, you know, when you get, you know, desks don't have a kind of advertising system behind them particularly, whereas beers do mm. and beer cans do. So you're kind of coupling these and products like that we, with the kind of bombardment of advertising, we get into the, you know, the me mega visual terrain of advertising and really kind of pure image, mm. and pure kind of signage. Um, so even though we had something drawn before with this idea of image and a scale, you know, the desk was an image that we recognised, it was a kind of sign for desk, and we know the kind of correct size that these things should have. Mm. And yet when you get into the mega visual, because things are so cooked up, the images and signs are so distorted and exploded, that there isn't really a kind of correct scale for kind of images as such. There's no correct logo size, you know, for Castlemaine 4X or for Heineken. Mm. You know, it's, you see it on billboards as well as seeing it in newspapers and on TV and film adverts. So it's, it's almost like even the more kind of culturally kind of cooked up it's become, the, the more it dissolves the idea of scale. There is no kind of correct scale for it. So, I mean, there is no correct scale for Heineken anymore. It doesn't even mean anything to talk about scale in that sense. This is one of the things that it kind of threw up for me. I mean, because you do use a lot of products, mm. and particularly you did a lot of um, Safeways carrier bags and the things that you bought from the supermarket, and mm. very kind of home, homely stuff, but they are also things which tend to be backed up with a kind of serious ad campaign mm. and so have this kind of cultural or uh, kind of iconic status. I mean, mm. I'm just curious why you picked particularly on these things. I mean, I see that this is perhaps one of the reasons, you know, that it is backed up by the advertising and hence thrown out of all sorts of scale. So, I mean, is this one of the reasons that you would choose that? Um, I, th I think partly because um, of subject matter, that it is just something that, that's discarded. I mean, it starts off as such a pristine um, object that, you know, that kind of desirable object and just ends up in, the, in, um, in a completely opposite way. So, I mean, I was quite interested in, in using something that was completely throwaway, that was quite literally rubbish. So, in a way, you know, I'm quite, I'm making rubbish. It's not, there's nothing precious about it. And, and again, it's quite important that when you see it that, 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 that you think of it in that way. Um, but then, of course, it does have formal elements to it in terms of how it's placed. And, and then I suppose you, you begin to make comparisons between the brands and between um, the actual pack packaging itself. It, it, somehow that becomes um, quite bizarre. Um, but I think, you know, what is interesting is, is, in fact, you know, there is a particular scale to these objects because there's only two sizes of beer cans that can be made. So, and in a way, everything has a measurement, you know. Yeah, but my, my kind of argument is that most of the times, when you, or often, you see beer cans and they are you know, on the side of a bus or they mm. are you know, inside the tube. And so they're not actually, there aren't only two sizes. There, there may be two sizes of products you can buy. Mm. But often when you see you know, a bottle of brown ale, then it's, you know, 20 foot high, <laughs> or it's an inch high in a newspaper, yeah. I, mean, yeah. so this, I mean, that was what interested me. But also, it's, I think with this, that you're drawing this direct comparison with Richard Serra, who's a kind of, I don't know, sculptor, sculptor, it's real kind of material yeah. stuff, and yet you kind of slip away from the material so much, I mean, it's interesting yeah. how you, you do slip from material to image, and yet you insist on kind of drawing these really sculptural comparisons. I mean, yeah. I was surprised when I first heard you talk about that and say this is still a kind of, it is sculpture still, it is yeah. very much, can be understood sculpturally. But I think, I think you know, when, when, when you do make something, you're, you're having to make those decisions. And in a way, you know, Richard Serra and Car Andre were really playing with that. Um, quite literally what happens when you place an object in a space, when you put something on the floor, when you lean it against a wall. Um, and I suppose that's partly um, where, where I'm coming from. But I think what's very important is that, um, I don't know, as you're saying, um, 
when we see these objects, they exist in different scales. And I think what I'm interested in is, is the fact that there isn't a correct scale. But you know, when you look at something, you know that it isn't the right scale. So you have to set up a value system of, of, of what you decide is the correct scale, whether that's using tape measure. Um, and as soon as, as soon as you change that, um, it completely yeah. makes that system fall down. For me, they're, 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 they're very um, physical um, objects. And when I see them, uh, as far as uh, you mentioned Carl Andre, and we mind the idea of the, the uh, objects and uh, activating a theatrical space, and that the way in which that actually affects you physically. Uh, some of the pieces I've seen, it was actually makes my body feel mm. I feel in the space of the of the room that I'm in makes me feel physically kind of uneasy. And uh, although it, that's kind of it, to me it, like the 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 um, the idea of the symbols of being a Holston or a Forex is 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 additional but to me the, the central kind of like expression I get from the, from the objects is that they are they are physically occupying the space mm. and in doing so in a in a perverse scale they make you one feel um, somehow you know, awkward physically, either like we are, I am too big or too small. But it's very much a physical kind of uh, experience of the object. Mm. But I don't think you'd get that without without the Holston and the Carlsberg because you, you s because you know exactly what it is. It's it throws you out. You have the, the slide of the, the, the sofa, the dirty, scuzzy uh, uh, yeah. sofa. Which, in some ways, is, is not reliant on a, on a kind of symbolism of, of a consumer's, mm. consumer's object or whatever. Uh, that I think, to me, that piece is exemplary in making me feel particularly uncomfortable. Mm. Do you have this? Mm. I do, but it's right at the end. Right. Yeah. I can't okay. come back. <laughs> <on. laughs> I mean, is that, is that sense of uncomfortableness a, a, a something which? applies to your idea of the right scale. You, you mentioned the right, you know, yeah. the right scale of 135 or 250. I'm interested in how you come about the decision what makes it right. I, well, it, it, in, a, in a way, it is a very p fine point. I think just repeating what I said before is that, it, it, you know, it, it can't, I mean, I found it's much easier to actually reduce objects. It's actually much harder to enlarge objects because somehow you, you bring something very different to that. Um, but I think it, it is that balance of it being yes, slightly uncomfortable. I mean, what's very important by cho the choice of objects, they're all familiar everyday objects that you have to be comfortable with because they inform such an imp important part of your life. And just by slightly altering those, those objects, it's uncomfortable because it's not what you expect. So yeah, the choice is very, very important. Um, no, I mean that they had to be can-like. I mean they had to look like cans, and not, you know, if you, I mean, I started looking at cans. I mean they get, you know, they get crushed in a variety of ways. I mean they all had to be, you know, the, the similar but different. So there isn't one can there. No. I mean, you talk about, the, I mean, that these were these kind of pristine products and you've, you've crushed through them. Is this a kind of attack on the whole kind of pristine product nature? I mean, there's, it seems to me there's two ways that you're getting at that. One is the kind of more obvi most obvious, is, which is that you are <coughs> making kind of old objects there, mm. even when they're new, they're, they're past it, mm. um, which is a kind of straightforward attack on that. But also it, it seems to me that you're taking these things and making them kind of inhabit the world that is made for them to inhabit. You know, they are, we perceive them as such icons because we see these extraordinary images of them all day, every day. Mm. And now you've kind of made the product, products kind of inhabit that impossible world as well. Mm. And you kind of made them, you've kind of given them what they deserve, really. Mm. Um, and that seems to me a kind of well, subverting or kind of an attack on the whole Mm. that whole system as well. I mean, I don't know if you want to say anything about either of those. Maybe the, 
the fact of making making them old at the start. I mean, is this is something you've done quite a lot? Yeah, I mean, it is because I mean, I think it, you you tend to think of, of certain objects um, at a certain point, as you're saying, whether it's a, a can being new and being very kind of perfect, but. Um, you know, I'm more interested in the history of the object, you know, how it's been touched, um, what's happened to it, rather than it being something that's pristine and new. And I think, in a way, again, if it's kind of gone through a journey, um, you're more comfortable with it because it's old, it's not new. Um, and you have a very different relationship with mm. it. Some of the works are very specific objects which you, yeah. you know, have around. I mean, the sofa, for example. Yeah. Just something that you used to see in the nearby taxi cab yeah. office or something um, but, and that's interesting that you choose very particular works that are very particular objects which are you have some which are very much product based kind of that everyone will know and brand new and you've done something too and then these other works which are replicating something that is already there which you know personally and other people have because they've kind of burned cigarettes out on them or stuck chewing gum on them I mean how do you see the two different styles of working um, well, I think, I think by choice, I mean, I think most of the objects that I choose are, are kind of objects that, that most people are familiar with. I mean, with the sofa, it's the kind of sofa that everybody wants to forget, but at some point they've, you know, they've used or they've sat on, but it's, it's not something they want to remember. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's important, that it, it is part of most people's, you know, consciousness or um, childhood or has formed some part of, the, of their life. I mean, it's not something that, that, that you've never experienced mm. before. So through a kind of specificity of kind of hoping for a, a generality that everyone's yeah. had a kind of similar yeah. experience. Yeah. Mm. Uh, this is uh, the London Business's telephone directory that has been reduced to 70% of the original size. So. Um, to, to do that, I had to take away 30% of the pages. Um, it was made on a, a photocopying machine, so it was reduced in length, breadth, and width. Um, but what became quite important about this piece of work was what was actually removed, what was actually taken away from the telephone book. Um, and I made a particular decision about what I was actually going to take out of the telephone book. Um, so I wanted to take away anything to do with um, commerce as, as much as I could in terms of, of um, to do with banks. Um, and what became quite important about the work was um, how you could, by removing the, the, these industries, suggest that the, the geography of the city had actually changed. And I guess once you take a business out of the telephone directory, in a way it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that, that obviously affects other businesses as well. Um, so why particularly the commerce ones? Well, because it was the business directory? Or? Yeah, because it was the business directory, yeah. yeah. And again, what was quite important about the work was where it was shown, which was just shown in, um, in the desk of, on the, on the desk of, um, in, in the gallery. So a lot of people didn't actually see the work. They might have just walked straight past it. But what was important about it was that it could still be used. I mean, it was still possible to um, dial the numbers and read the names from the telephone book. I mean, this picks up on something else about miniaturization, as well as it being quite precious. It also gives the viewer a sense of omnipotence, you know, that you are you're kind of godlike in a way with a, with a miniature yeah. and in this sense you know you were, you were godlike because you could simply remove information that well you know you you were in charge of taking out 30 percent of London's businesses yeah which is quite a sizable thing to do um I mean I think with this piece what what became interesting was what was removed I think with the other pieces you if the if the if the desk or um, whatever object has been reduced by 50%, you don't actually think about the 50% that's missing. Whereas, yeah, this piece, what was important about it was the 30% that was that was was missing. In a way, that became more important. Um, and I mean, to begin with, uh, it was random the pages that I took away. But then it became important what I did take away because then I I felt kind of morally responsible for whatever I removed from from the telephone book. Um, but 
you know, what was interesting about it was how quite literally the geography of the city could be changed. And it's very particular that it's information that's being removed, really. Um, you know, that, that they are in numbers. Mm. You know, it is a kind of pure form of information. Mm. Um, and with all of these works, it's interesting that the information gets lost. A few of the other pieces you made after this, it was very much about information as well. And yet it's all, if I'm right, it's all done by photocopier. So it's never, it's not been scanned in again. So mm. it never it never attains this kind of pure state of information, it's never a kind of binary thing. Mm. It's always this kind of analogue destruction of information. Mm. It's kind of curious um, pearls acting against each other. Mm. But I think there's something about using a photocopier, so if you use a photocopier, you, you tend to think that you've read, you know, the information. Um, and that's part of the reason of, of photocopying something, you probably never ever read it, but you photocopy it. Mm. Um, and I mean, I mean, actually, photocopied every page. So in a way, it was a bit, a bit like ingesting all of that information. Although obviously, I've, n I've never read all of the pages. Um. Would, 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 the, would the work um, change fundamentally like if uh, you were able to make a large number of these objects? I, mean, I know that you make almost everything yourself, so mm. it makes it kind of difficult to complicate our time-consuming, uh, but. Is there something about the fact that they are kind of uh, single objects, almost like um, that they have an aura of their own? I mean, in the way they, they, they kind of oddness of picking up that, for instance, is that it's a, it's a clear contradiction to what is the everyday. Mm -hmm. if, if you were able to make, do something so as to make that reduced object almost to take over the thing of being everyday by its numbers, I mean, just theoretically, if you were able to convince BT produce a range of these books on a scale, would that, would that and how would that perhaps change the significance of what you're doing? Uh, I, th I think it would, I mean, it would change it completely. I mean, I think that there is, it is important, I think, that, that it's actually in a way handmade and I don't want to produce hundreds of them. Um, I mean, what, what is interesting is in fact that this is almost like the right scale for a telephone book in the sense that it's more handy. It can fit in your bag. And I think in, in New York, they actually have a phone book this size. And in, in France, they have a phone book this size. So um, they exist. But I mean, that's why the work is so particular to, I couldn't show this anywhere else. It has to be the telephone book that's used. But I don't really want to mass produce them. It is very much about it just being this one, this one book. We should point out that these are your cigarettes as well. Oh yeah. On the desk, in <laughs> case anyone hadn't tweaked that. They, they are real. No, they're, uh, they're uh, another work by this. Yeah. I was wondering, is there is there some sort of relationship between um, taking the sort of you know, he talks about taking certain parts of the phone directory out, which you thought was commercial, but choosing Rothmans as a as a brand of cigarettes? Because to me, I mean. Rothmans in their advertising always given that sort of uh, a certain image that is different from say Marlboro or mm -hmm. or Embassy or something like that. I mean, is that is that a decision? It's just very small thing, but um, no, I mean I I'd actually made other packets, so I did actually right. make Marlboro packets, it wasn't particularly Rothmans. Yeah. It's just in the world to me, Rothmans always given a sort of very um, businessy image. <laughs> Um, in a way, this is quite a departure from, from the other work in that um, but, uh, but my starting point for this really followed on from the telephone book in that um, I started off actually collecting statistics um, to do with um, the area around the gallery, which is the showroom, which is in the East End of London. And I began to collect statistics on kind of commerce, on population, um, just anything really to do with the local local area. Um, and what I came across when I was getting this information was um, a survey that was done in 1943 um, to do with the London the County of London plan, which was about redesigning, um, particularly the East End at the end of the war. Um, 
and in the local history library there was a was survey that was carried out at the same time which was really in response to the County of London plan and I think at the time very few areas actually responded to, to this, this way of restructuring London but the East End did and um, the Stepney Reconstruction group, group quite literally counted everything in the East End at that particular time even down to the number of cows in, in the cow sheds. Um, and what was incredible about this survey was, was how it existed. I mean, it was an archive that was quite literally falling to pieces. And um, through reading through the survey, I came across the housing survey that they, they issued to a number of people, um, asking them the type of housing that they'd like to have at the end of the war. And what most people said was that they'd like to live in, in a modern house. And what the County of London plan recommended was that 90% of all housing in the area would actually be flats and only 10% would be houses. So um, what the majority of people wanted never happened. So what I wanted to do was actually build the house that everybody said that they wanted. Um, and so what was built in the gallery was uh, a one-to-one -one scale version of, of a bungalow. Um, I mean, it's not exactly, in a way, it's a dream house. It's the kind of house that would have been built in the suburbs. It's not the type of house that you'd find in the East End. Um, and so it, it was quite incongruous in terms of the choice of house. Um, but what was important about it was um, the gallery itself is, it exists on, on, in a, um, on, a, on a row of houses. So the gallery itself is, is almost out of place. So I actually wanted to continue the line of the houses. Um, and then in the back of the space, was the archive itself. The archive was photocopied, so you could actually go into the back of, of the gallery and read through the archive. Um, I, mean, I think what's very important about the piece, I mean, it was a big departure, partly because of um, being invited to make the piece. It wouldn't have been possible without um, the support of Kim Sweet at the showroom, and um, um, an architect called Joan Altram was, was, was involved in, in actually working out how that the house could actually fit into the gallery, and, and I didn't build the house. It was built by, by builders. So it was quite a departure in terms of the work. Um, and this is just kind of an example of some of the material from the archive. And I think what's quite surprising about it, on, on the left is actually the housing survey. Um, And the material itself, in a way, was quite shocking because, um, I mean, oops, I've gone too far. <laughs> um, as you can see here, I mean, quite a lot of the letters were actually were, were kind of written to, to Parliament, and, um, and most of the letters had typing mistakes in them, they had crossings out, and, and what became interesting was just the, you know, the form of the information, that it, it just seemed so incredible, again, kind of li um, living today, how everything is desktop published, and it seemed incredible that these letters would still be sent in this form. And one of the interesting things you, you were saying is that it was a departure and it was kind of slipping almost away from you because you weren't making it yourself. It was produced uh, by other people, which is yeah. a, a very much a first for you. Um, and yet the house itself is finally it's becoming almost itself again because it's a one-to-one -one scale mm. house. And so only as the object is kind of becoming itself do you actually slip away and the work for you is almost elsewhere as you're reading through all this, doing this research. And it's almost that the research is an awful lot of the project. Mm. So as the object is finally becoming you know, itself, so your vision, your vision of the work has slipped out of that and become this kind of ethos of doing the research. Mm. That's an interesting kind of dichotomy there. And also that uh, although the house is a kind of facade, I mean, it was very hard to see through what was behind there because you had these net curtains up. Um, but although it was just a facade, it was it was as real a facade as any as any facade to a building. I mean, it, these were. <coughs> full-size bricks and full-size guttering and just as you would buy, get from the builder's merchants yeah. to build a house. So in a sense it was, it was very, I found viewing the work, it was very difficult to kind of reconcile 
the fact that you were seeing this and you were viewing it as if it was I don't know a miniature or an expanded or something you were viewing it as if it was unreal and yet everything about it you know the guttering was just guttering you know mm. the bricks were just bricks and the glass was just glass and it was a very peculiar sensation because I all found that it kind of it almost had a kind of oily surface and so far as my my vision always slipped off it I kept walking through the gallery and going through the back and coming around at the front and I always whenever I turned my back I felt that I hadn't seen it I thought well was that really there you know I had to turn around and look at it again it was almost the kind of familiarity yeah. of the object made you s just not even see it really yeah. it was a very peculiar sensation so this thing about being a kind of dislocated space or being uneasy physically with the object I found that this was possibly the most powerful of the ones that in that sensation and yet it was it was not small it was not big it was a kind of full size thing and that was something I wasn't expecting at all with it I, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that it's that it is in a building and that mm. it, you know that it's in a gallery so in a way you know the bricks become art bricks mm. the um, you know the scribbles kind of become art scribbles although it's presented as as um, as as a, as a brick and you know as as a sheet of photocopy paper um, but I think you know what was important about it it was a very a small portion of the building was actually built mm. um, you know just enough so that it was house like or bungalow like um, I find it curious because they always were looking at these things as if they were not real, and yet you knew they were. And so there was this fact of thinking, oh God, was my house like this? You know, I mean, obviously my house was not like that, but it was, had the same kind of guttering and the same, mm. same door frames and stuff, you know. So it was, you realize just how fragile these things that you build, almost a kind of whole, it has such a kind of reverberating quality, kind mm. of deep in your. Uh, consciousness, you know, this idea of home, um, and yet here, here was a home that just looked so fragile and slippery, really. And you thought, well, you know, it, it should, is my house, is my guttering as kind of stupid as that? Is my are the bricks in my house as kind of toy-like as this? Mm. And there was this whole throwing back and forth that it was kind of somehow real and not real, and, mm. and somehow you know, authentic and not authentic and it was there and it wasn't there. Mm. There was all these different, I mean it was a very odd work to be next to. I mean obviously one of the things is that you don't expect to find a building indoors but well, there was one but once you got past that everything else started to just make compound matters mm. and it kind of got worse and worse. It's kind of vertiginous or something. So I found it a very curious piece to look at because you weren't quite kind of couldn't believe that these things were real elements and yet they evidently were. But I think all the things that you've mentioned before about the work objects existing as imi image, I mean this is very much an image, mm -hmm. although I mean I think you know the contradiction is that it's solid, it's mm -hmm. brick, it's actually built as a house is built but it is still a facade because you know the whole house isn't there and it, you know and you walk around it you can't walk around the whole of the house and I think, you know, it still plays um, with that perception of knowing something that's real, but it's not real, and you still have to name it. And, and, the, and, and when you make, I mean, I think when you, when you get to that point, that's when you have to decide what it actually is. I think I'd only been to this gallery once <laughs> before, and it was some months before this show. And I remember arriving and coming in and thinking, God, I don't remember that being there. <laughs> and obviously it never been there, I mean, but just that initial reaction was yeah. that I don't remember the gallery being built around this house so yeah. it really kind of you know, you threw you completely coming yeah. into it well somebody did actually ask me if it was always there mm. if it was, yeah. the neighbours walking along with their dogs <laughs> and looking through because it's just got this huge yeah. plate glass window at the front so you can see it from the street really easily but I think what's interesting about it is that there is a um, well, I mean it's kind of all medium density housing around there but the the nearest block of flats to, to, to the showroom has recently been refurbished with, you know, kind of um, individual front doors and kind of all kind of individual elements. So in a way, that's mm. kind of happened mm. to the area. Um. Mm. Um, I mean, what do you think about that, that 
Well, I mean, I, I, mean, I think what, yeah, I mean, it, it is a change in terms of not having a preconceived idea of what's being made. I mean, what was made was what came out of doing the research, but I mean, it was actually based on a 1950s bungalow. And I did actually try and, um, well, I didn't make it, but, but um, the people that made it did actually work from, from very small photographs to, to kind of get the, you know, the features. I mean, what's very important about it is, you know, that it is a 50s bungalow, that it, you know, that it has, I mean, it is real. I mean, there are bungalows that look like this. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, I mean, it's even though it's, it is the one-to-one -one scale piece that you've done. You know, it's it's also one that is a complete fantasy. So even though it's kind of the most real of them all, it's yeah. it's also the one that is a kind of fabrication of all these people's dreams of where they would want to live. Yeah. Yeah. This is the most recent piece of work that I've made that's in an exhibition at the moment at the ICA called Belladonna. Um, and this is, this is a, a BSA Tour of Britain racing bike that has been enlarged to 135% of the original size. Um, it was made specifically for this, 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 this where, where it's shown, um, which is just outside the, the entrance to, to the main gallery. So when you walk into the ICA, um, you have to pass by the racing bike to get into the main gallery. Um, and what's quite interesting about it is that um, when, when the show opened, lots of people said to me, where's your work? And they'd actually just walked straight past it. Um, but it is, it's, it is quite, quite large, as you can see from, from the image on the left. <coughs> and again, it, it's the, the, the choice of, of object is very important. It's, it's not actually my bike, it's actually my partner's bicycle. Um, I didn't want to make a, a, rate, a, a, a mountain bike, I actually wanted to make a bike that, that wasn't particularly modern, that, that had a history, and it was faithfully made in terms of kind of each bit, bit of rust, um, as faithfully as possible, um, how soiled it was, was, was reproduced. So in a way, you know, it is a copy, it's, it's, it's a photographic enlargement of the, of the original object. Again, by going for a very specific, personally known object, you're trying to uh, kind of evoke a, an object that everyone will know, that this is a kind of specifically dated bicycle. A lot of the viewers come into the gallery will know pretty much, I mean, it may well have been like their first bike, mm. and there's that kind of age to it, and that everyone will know. You've said before that you, I mean, you didn't want to make a mountain bike because it, it might look like a kind of prototype or that there was going to be some giant bike that everyone was going to have to get in the next two years. Um, <laughs> but this is, you know, everyone knows that this is kind of old news, it's past it, and so and there is something mm. kind of odd going on. It's this, it's this kind of picking out the very specific and personal to try and get something that everyone will recognize. It's kind of Paradox call, but it, it does sort of work. Mm. It's kind of interesting. Um, from your earlier um, slide in the tomato talking about purity of the photographic process, and uh, in a number of ways throughout the works you've shown, is it a, a, a kind of a, an aspect of the, um, okay, like also the idea of the single object or the <laughs> because although you said that you failed to reproduce uh, the, you know, the, the rust of the scuff marks, you, you know, you, you re reproduced them in a process, it's mm. processed. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we mentioned that the purity of the photography, I think, well, this question always comes up about the idea of computer-generated images. And I wonder what is the fundamental distinction between a uh, computer-manipulated image of a tomato, which would be, in some respect, impure, with the of the distress of a genuine bike by taking a bit of sandpaper to it or, mm. or putting a bit of delicately putting a bit of moisture 
I'm not sure. I mean, one of the interesting things about a computer generated image or one that's been scanned in and then altered and then printed out is that it there's a point where it, c where it kind of evaporates into nothingness, where it just becomes a kind of code. Um, and yet that's never the case with these. But I, I see your point, and it is a kind of it is a complete fabrication. It's but I, th I think in a way it's, it does come back to, to photography, it comes back to kind of the distinction between documentary reportage, between, you know, pur purity in that, you know, and particularly, uh, you know, today, um, you know, most of the images that we see are manipulated. Um, One thing I wanted to ask was, how do you see your relation to um, surrealism? I mean, it's one of the things that thinking about your work it keeps cropping up this yeah. idea of surrealism and how do you how do you see your relation to that period I th um yeah I, I think it's very strong i mean i i don't think that um i mean i think what what is very very different about it is that that i am just presenting an object as an object and the only difference is you know the change in scale um and I think, you know, part of, um, of that process is I think it does, it draws on the, the same um, expectations from the viewer in terms of, of, as you said with this piece, kind of um, drawing back to your childhood and perhaps the fear that objects can, can, can bring out of you as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I think there is a direct correlation. Did, didn't you say that with this piece, kind of half the people missed it and the other half were quite kind of scared of it? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I, mean, I, th I mean, I think the, the I don't know, I don't know how to answer that in terms of what the message is. I mean, I think, you know, for me, for me, I mean, just still going back to the kind of photographic process, what's important for me is, is just how, you know, how, how knowledge comes about through through imagery, and a lot of the, Im you know, a lot of our history is is complete comes in completely the wrong scale kind of our personal history from childhood photographs. Um, you know, you see an image, you don't know if, it, if that was really you, whether you don't even know if you remember that moment, but you see a photograph and you, and you, you believe that you do. Um, so I think, you know, I am interested in that, in, in memory, but, I, I, but, I, but I'm not sure how, how much I trust that, and I think part of the work might be perhaps be about that, trying to understand that. I think we've run the full hour. I mean, if there are any more questions, I guess we can answer them. But well, there doesn't seem to be any. Yeah, where's the sofa? <laughs> where's the sofa? Yeah, do you want to whiz through? I think it's. Uh, I have to warn you, there are a lot more slides. I think, oh, I but, see, right. but they're all kind of jumbled up. Oh, it might be. Yeah. That's the sofa. <laughs> and what size is that? It's 50% or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
It's, um, hang on. It's actually a, a copy of Walter de Maria's Earth Room. It's actually just 4% of, of the original that was built in a, um, in a, in a um, house in, um, in North London. Again, a real sculptural <laughs> work. Yeah. I, th I mean, I, 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 c I can see what you're saying, but I think in a way, you know, that you're, you're seeing the, these works photographically. I mean, I think you do have to actually see them and experience them. And I think, you know, once you have, you know, maybe you can't see them more than once in terms of, um, you know, that, that, that's it, they've worked, you know, that, that it's kind of ended. So um, I think, you know, again, that they're images, they're not objects that you're looking at. Are you saying that the idea of, say, the uncanny, where something is slightly felt to be out of place, even though it's very familiar, um, but if, if that's kind of too highlighted, too kind of obvious, then it's no longer uncanny, it's something, something kind of mutant? I find that I, when I've seen your work, it's often the ones which work the best or where it's, say, a group show or something and you have mm. one piece and it, it can quite easily be missed mm. and then you kind of catch it and you think, hang on, what, what is going on there? Mm. I mean, when I've, um, particularly at Carsten Schubert's where you had an awful lot of work mm. and there's lots of different things going on, I mean, it, it was a real bombardment. Mm. And you were just, re I felt in that just really disorientated. It was very difficult mm. to think about anything in particular. But the more effective ones I find are where they are. They just sort of slip in and mm. you do get that kind of uncanny moment where you, this is something very familiar and so, but something's not right and you can't, mm. it's not immediately obvious what it is and it, it just kind of sits. Because mm. you recognize it so powerfully, your, your brain's saying, oh, well, that is, that's a telephone book, obviously. And yet there's another part of you saying, well, no, this is completely wrong. And it's not, it's not like really powerful, but it, and it doesn't kind of jump on you, but it is kind of insistent and kind of gnaws. And it does make you very awkward when yeah. you're in the presence of it. But, but I think in a way what, I mean, that, that was very difficult to show in a gallery. Mm. I'd never shown in a yeah, gallery before. Yeah. And I think, you know, what's quite important about a lot of these works is they're not actually shown in, in well, <laughs> um, in, in a, in art galleries, you know, they're, they're shown in, um, um, or if you like, in a white space. I mean, they're, they're shown in spaces where people have decided to show art, but, and they're about that particular space, which is unconventional. So a lot of the work I is about, 
um, being familiar in that environment. It's, it's not about bringing anything new into that environment. It's just a bit like pointing out that environment. It's not making anything new. I don't want to make anything new. You know, everything that, in a way, that, that's here already exists. They're not new things. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, I think you know, I think it. Uh, what, what I suppose is p partly what I've inherited, what, you know, from the serialism is is taking two objects and joining them together, and that's in a way, uh, you know, that the starting point really was the tomato of wanting to put a skin around a tomato, you know, taking the skin off of one object and putting it around an up the other. And I think that's, you know, that that's kind of been left as the works progress. And I think it is in a way closer to, as I say, documentary. It's closer to something that's about recording and about just presenting it, not, although it's manipulating it in terms of process, it's not um, making it any, anything other than, than what, what's already there. I think when you, when you inherit something, whether it's surrealism or surreal, you, you do like damage to the original, or in some way you ruin the original, um, like particularly with the big hands and the surreal. Yeah, sure. They're, they're recruited sure. into that domain, they're not bothered to that anymore. So I'm just wondering about uh, centrally in relation to these principles and the kind of, you know, what the real nature of the dialogue is, which I think is something that's been picked up on mm. when you mentioned this really. But I think in relation to Sarah as well. But I think, I mean, what... But I, but I think in a way, what I mean, I suppose what kind of David's been been talking about is is the frame up of a photographic process. And I think you know, yeah, it, it, it's not about the purity of of, of Richard Serra. It, it's it's about, for me, um, what you have to take on when, when you're physically making something. Um, You know, and how these objects actually exist in space, in 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 a, in a place, in an environment. You, you mean phenomenologically or politically? Because you seem to be talking phenomenologically before, when you're talking about the reception of the hmm. object into the conscious or the unconscious or whatever it's missed. I think what someone said before about the aggressiveness of surrealism, and the video like, or the aggressiveness of the Sarah, is you see. Yeah, but, but I mean, I think that, that, has, that, that has something to do with scale. That has something very much to do about, you know, whether quite literally of removing. You know, if you remove something, what, where does that go? Um, I mean, I don't think you can look at these objects and not consider space, because that's, that's what you're bringing to them. 
because it's relational. I mean, it's to, you know, it's to do with with perspective. It's to do with how close you're to something, how far away you are to something. Which is, which is perhaps essentially a, a, is a kind of a phenomenon yeah. experience of space. I think that we <coughs> talking talking too much about surrealism or, or, or our historical references may be uh, something of red herring. In my interpretation, the work is most poignant when it has least the reference to art with a capital A. Mm. If there's any, maybe a last question, or if there's not, because I think we've we were only meant to be an hour, and we're an hour and a quarter, so well then we'll we wrap it up. The bar and yes. The conversation from there. Um, I uh, uh, like to thank you for coming along. I like to thank Elizabeth and David. Um, the piece you saw here is on the ICA, and I think you should see it as it is—a real thing, not as a slide. It's a different thing. We all together. Um, and I hope you can come to John Stathatos, who's talking next week, um, next Friday. But in the meantime, I'd like to thank him for that. Well roasted. <laughs> hard work at the end there. He's excellent. Yeah, that was Yeah. Yeah. No, there was people who knew what we were talking about. Well, so yeah. I knew the people who were asking the questions at the end. Rather than just like you know, I don't want to be
did you put those in reception or something? Very important. I picked his cigarettes, gave them to Jeremy.